Hello and welcome to the Ghosts and Folklore podcast. I'm Mark Rees, and on each episode, I investigate a different, weird, and wonderful subject. And on this episode, we are going to explore some incredibly strange creatures known as corpse dogs. Yes, corpse dogs, or hellhounds, as they are also ominously known, and you'll be glad to know that the folklore surrounding them is just as spine-chilling as their names. Now, the corpse dogs are, in a way, a combination of two more commonly encountered types of phenomena, the first one being the death omen, such as the corpse candle or the kanelkorf in Welsh, which I've mentioned many a time on this podcast, but the corpse candles are strange lights that look like candles, hence the name, and their appearance is always a bad sign because it serves as a warning of an imminent death. And these corpse dogs work in much the same way. If the corpse dogs make an appearance, that usually means there is a death on the way. And like the candles, their manner and appearance will offer some clues as to who exactly is going to die. So in the case of the corpse candle, it is said that the number of candles will indicate the number of people going to die, and their size and their colour will indicate things like the ages of those unfortunate individuals destined to shuffle off this mortal coil. And that is the nature of these death omens. Sadly, they're not very specific. They are quite cryptic in the way they offer us clues. They don't give us the names of the people. They just turn up in different colours, different sizes, go in at different speeds, and then we have to be detectives about it and try and work out exactly what they mean. So that's the first of the two phenomena that the corpse dogs share similarities with. The other, of course, is dogs, of course. The clue is in the name, but more than just normal dogs, they are supernatural dogs. Another subject I've spoken about a lot in the past. In fact, if you go back to the early days of this podcast, I was a little bit obsessed, actually. Episodes 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9, 5 in a row, all include different kinds of dogs from Welsh folklore, from the heroic Gellert to a real-life Scooby-Doo dog, and even the corgis, the Welsh corgis that the Welsh fairies are said to head into battle on. But of all these supernatural dogs, the one with the most similarities, I guess, to the corpse dog is a spooky supernatural dog known as the Gwiltki. Now, the Gwiltki is a monstrous dog that patrols the lonely lanes of Wales at night, terrifying people with its glowing red eyes. And I even suggested the Gwiltki might have a tenuous connection with the Welsh poet Dylan Thomas on an old episode. But the main difference between the Gwiltki and the corpse dog is that the Gwiltki is just out there terrifying people. The corpse dog, as you'll come to discover, is usually there for a purpose. Quite a macabre purpose, it has to be said, but a purpose nonetheless. Which is what makes it a death omen, which is what puts it in the same category as the corpse candles and the phantom funerals. It's just up to you to decipher its message. And before I begin, I should mention quickly that the corpse dogs have also been compared to a more mythological dog, the Kun Anun, which very briefly, Kun Anun means the dogs or the hounds of Anun, which is the other world in Welsh mythology, and they feature in the Mabinogion, and they're mixed up in, in the Wild Hunt and everything. But I won't dwell on that too much right now. That really is an episode for another day. Suffice to say that these corpse dogs share similarities with the death omens that predict an upcoming death, and they share similarities with some other supernatural dogs said to be stalking the wilds of Wales at night. And so, on that note, let us crack on with the folklore. And to begin at the beginning, the belief in corpse dogs, we are told, was really grisly. What a great description. The belief was really grisly. As recently as the early 20th century when these accounts were recorded. And at the time, they were seen as being just as important as the corpse candles, as I've mentioned, and the phantom funerals and other 
popular forms of death omens that were big back in the day. Now, one lady who went in search of these corpse dogs to find people who'd encountered them in the early 20th century was our roving reporter, Ms. Lewis. And she says, to quote, It is true that I have failed to get the knowledge of their appearance that I wanted and can therefore not give a very good description of them. There are those I know that have seen corpse candles, a spirit, and the toily, with toily being a phantom funeral in this case. But of the many tales concerning hellhounds, another name for these corpse dogs, I have heard of but one person who actually saw one, and his free description must therefore suffice us. So, while she's telling us she knows many people who have seen ghosts and death omens, she can only find one person who has seen a corpse dog with their own eyes, and this is his tail. This particular corpse dog was seen at a place called Slyn by the Isev, which she doesn't specify exactly where this is. She does this quite often intentionally to disguise places, but I am assuming it is in Gwynedd. But this particular corpse dog was seen at a place called Slyn by the Isev by a member of the family who happened to be living there then. And that was about 152 years ago, which is a strangely precise estimation of a date. Oh, it was roughly, roughly 152 years ago. So if my own strangely precise estimate is correct, that would put these events at around the year 1759. And so in 1759, in Slyn by the an inmate of the house was taken ill one day, and at night the farm dog began to howl in a very unusual and disturbing manner. On the following night, as one of the sons of the family went out to look after the animals before going to bed, he heard a sound which he thought was made by a sheep or a pig coming towards him with a curious noise of, of chains. He could hear a chain clanking quite plainly. So I, I'm going to interrupt again quickly here because he set the scene for us, or rather she has set the scene using his words. And somebody in this house has fallen seriously ill very quickly. The dog is making a very strange howling sound. And then when one of the boys goes out to feed the animals at night, he can hear something like some kind of animal dragging chains about and approaching him. And as it got closer, he saw the thing clearly. And this is our best description of what is believed to be a corpse dog. And he says that he saw a dog that was little in appearance, of a sort of reddish-grey colour, dragging a chain. So it was indeed the sound of a chain that he heard, almost like, like a canine Jacob Marley dragging this chain behind it. And just like that, it was gone. It ran past him with the speed of lightning, and he saw no sign of it again. He supposed someone had been leading it, but couldn't see anyone about. So while this might at first not sound like the most terrifying of encounters compared to, say, a snarling, quirky dog, which, you know, you might be worried is going to rip you limb from limb. This this little, little terrier-sounding type dog, this little dog dragging a, a chain along bizarrely before disappearing, well, that, that, that wasn't so bad. He just assumed that somebody had let their dog off the leash and it was dark and it was night time and they couldn't find them and off they'd gone. But to return to the tale and directly afterwards, their own dog, not the, the corpse dog or whatever this dog might have been, but the family's own dog began to howl once more in the most dismal and extraordinary way. And when this sound was heard, all hope of recovery for the sick person was given up. And indeed, it was not long before he drew his last breath. So they knew, that family knew somehow that this strange noise their dog was emitting, this weird, this weird howling, 
was a sign that the end was nigh. The end was definitely imminent. But how could they know this? Why would they think this? Why would they make this leap from a strange dog's hell to certain death? How did they know this little dog had been a death omen, as it were? Well, we are told that the tradition about corpse dogs is that they have been sent from hell, from the fiery place down below, to the country of the earth to fetch corpses. Very much like a dog to fetch things, but in this case, they haven't been sent to fetch bones or sticks or squeaky toys even, something much less fun. They've been sent to fetch corpses. And as a rule, death follows wherever they appear. And when they approach a dwelling where death is coming, they are seen by the dog of the house and cause the animal such terror that it foams at the mouth and utters dismal howlings as long as the hellhounds remain nearby. Which, never mind corpse dogs, sounds like quite a terrifying description of the normal dogs. If they're foaming at the mouth, it sounds like they're turning rabid. But to continue with the description, and we are told that that is the reason why a dog howls before death. When you hear that mournful sound, you may be quite sure that a corpse dog is in the neighbourhood. And if you observe which way the dog's head is turned, in that same direction is the demon animal. Some dogs are daring enough to go to the door of the sick person's house where the corpse dog watches and howl beneath the window of the room where death awaits his prey. So the dog not only howls when the corpse dog is near, but it turns its head towards it and in some cases will actually set off after it towards the room of the dying person where the corpse dog is watching over them. And to continue, there's more to the description to continue. Although corpse dogs are, as a rule, invisible, yet of their existence, nobody has a doubt that one has actually been seen by an individual is as good a proof as if a hundred or more had seen them. So there you have it. That's the description of the corpse dog. And while I'm a little bit more sceptical than our reporter there, for me, the fact that one person has seen a corpse dog, apparently has seen a small dog with a chain, is not quite the same as 100 people seeing a corpse dog. But nevertheless... It's not only people that are seeing them or one person that has seen them. There are some other reliable witnesses, we are told. The dogs themselves. And to continue, dogs are reliable witnesses of their presence in any place where they come. They strike terror in any religious family, especially if any member of it be ill, and no small anxiety is felt until the foul creatures leave the neighbourhood and the house dogs cease to howl and foam. So really, it's not the human evidence we should be looking at in this case, it's the dogs who are more in tune to the presence of these corpse dogs, whether they be invisible or not. But while these corpse dogs come into people's homes and watch over the dying, what exactly are they doing? Why are they watching over? Well, to go back to our roving reporter, the hour of their visitation to a locality is generally towards the edge of night, just before cockcrow. Usually at that hour, the dogs will begin howling in heart-rending fashion, as if pitying him who will soon be seized by the teeth of the hounds of hell and find themselves gripped in the claws of the king of terrors. Which doesn't sound like a fate you'd wish on your worst enemy, does it? To be seized by the teeth of the hounds of hell and gripped in the claws of the king of terror suggests to me the souls they take away will not be resting easy afterwards. And she notes that while most, if not all people, 
will have heard dogs howling. I've certainly heard dogs howling. I'm sure you've heard dogs howling. There is a difference between the heart-rending howls they make when the corpse dogs are near and a regular howl from a dog who just wants to be fed or wants to chase cats or whatever other reason they howl for. And we are told that people used to say, after hearing this specific spine-chilling howl, that we shall be sure to hear of a death very soon when they heard this. So, all in all, these corpse dogs are pretty creepy creatures, and they upset the normal dogs. These invisible dogs come along, creep around to drag off souls to the king of terrors, leaving the normal dogs howling in terror. But the strange thing with these corpse dogs is that if they are invisible, how do people know they are corpse dogs with the exception of that one later witness we had who saw the little red dog with a clanking chain running about he certainly didn't start anything he already knew of this tradition so where did it come from well to return to our raven reporter ra <laughs> roving reporter <laughs> she's not well she might be raven it's not for me to say but she's certainly roving to return to our roving reporter she explains to us that we need to be careful that we only listen to the howlings of certain dogs who are tuned into this and not only dogs but as she'll explain to horses as well and to quote it is well known that dogs and horses are creatures gifted with very keen senses of scent and sight, especially after the shades of night have fallen on the face of nature, and particularly as regards sight or smell of anything beyond the usual limits of this world, such as spirits, corpse candles, toily, as in phantom funerals, and hellhounds, as in corpse dogs, and the like. But there is a great difference in the powers of individual dogs and horses in this respect. It is just the same with mankind. Some have been endued with powers to behold the unseen, while others, again, are found blind to every vision of the kind. That is the reason why it is useless to heed every dog that howls, but only certain ones in cases where it has been found that a death always follows their howling. And what she's telling us here is that dogs and horses, a bit like humans, some of them have might, I guess what you'd call psychic powers, and others might not. And just like you wouldn't believe anyone who walked up to you and claimed to be psychic and claimed to have these abilities and claimed to be able to communicate with the other side, it's exactly the same with the animals. It is the same with dogs. Not all dog howling means something supernatural is going on. Now, I should make it clear that the author of this is a firm believer in such powers. And of course, the way you look at this will be through the lens of your own personal beliefs. And if you are somebody that believes in psychic abilities in humans, then maybe you can take that leap and say, well, yes, maybe it's present in dogs and in horses and other creatures as well. If, on the other hand, you think it's all a load of rubbish, if you don't think humans have these powers, never mind dogs, never mind horses, then you are less likely to think so. So, really, you can make up your own minds on this, but bear in mind that the lady writing these words was a believer, and as such, maybe it's more natural for her to be inclined to believe that animals can have them as well. And if maybe you are sitting on the fence, maybe you're unsure about all these psychic powers, well, she does have another tale of a supposedly psychic dog to tell us about. A psychic dog called Brins, B-R-I-N-S, of Timar. Timar, again, she doesn't specify where Timar is, and she does like being a bit vague, but Brins from Timar was a shaggy and red-eyed dog, and he was not a particularly good sheep dog, but he was very faithful to his owners and full of doggish common sense. So by all accounts, he was a good boy, just not much use working with the sheep. And the voice of Brins, the howling of Brins, always struck terror in the community 
for well was it known that someone was sure to die if Brins opened his mouth to howl at night. People would go and look to see in which direction his head was pointed, so as to know where about the death would be. So going back to the old idea of corpse candles and the death omens here, you could follow the dog's gaze, look at the direction of his head, to try and work out to be a detective, a death detective, to try and decipher which unfortunate individual was being singled out by that dog. And in one particular tale, we are told that there was an old butcher who had exceeded the allotted span of human days by 10 years, which is a great way of saying he'd been on this earth 10 years longer than he should have been already, but he'd exceeded the allotted span of human days by 10 years. And at last, his time came. He was taken ill, and from the hour when he began to keep to his bed, the old dog Brins began to howl. As night after night went by, John Hughes, John Hughes was his name, John Hughes, growing weaker and weaker, so did the dog continue his howlings. At first, he gave tongue near his own home, but as the old man's end drew near, Bryn went over to his house, the two places not being far apart. At last, such was his boldness, the dog's boldness, that he crept right under the window of the room where the dying man lay and howled steadily until the end came. After this, his voice was not heard again at night until just before another death occurred. It was indeed bold of the old dog to go and howl beneath the sick man's window, because the wise who know say that as a death approaches, the hellhounds draw round the house, and on the last night they enter the room and stay by the bedside, so as to be near when the breath leaves the body. So not only was Brins supposedly psychic, he was also fantastically brave, because while we can't see these invisible dogs, he would have been aware of this pack of hellhounds that gathered around waiting for that old man's final breath to leave his body. And on that cheerful note... We've reached the end of that tale, and we've reached the end of another episode of the Ghosts and Folklore podcast. As always, if you've enjoyed this episode, please consider hitting the subscribe button if you haven't already. And if you'd like to support the podcast, you can treat me to a coffee via my website, or you could just leave a quick, nice review or give it a thumbs up or five stars or whatever the options are on whatever platform you are consuming this on. And if you'd like more weird and wonderful tales, as well as this podcast, I've also published a number of books which are available from all good bookshops offline and on. And you can follow me on social media, on Twitter, on Facebook and on Instagram. And on that note, it just leaves me to say thank you very much for listening. Dioch and Varion am Rando. I've been Mark Reese. This has been my Ghosts and Folklore podcast beaming to you from Wales to the world. And until next time, if your dog does start howling in a peculiar way, you might want to check in which direction it's looking. No star. <laughs>